When we talk about computer systems, we typically are referring to general purpose computers. And that's things like this, a laptop, so called because you can use it on your lap, or um, perhaps some sort of desktop computers as well. Again, the clue's in the name, we use them on a desk. Now general purpose computers can be used for multiple different things, that's where the name comes from. So they will run an operating system that you can update or replace with a different one. Don't like Windows? Put Linux on it. You can get different pieces of software for it, you can use it for making music, editing photographs, films, watching Netflix, browsing the web. There's so many different things you could do with it. You can also normally upgrade its components, maybe improve the RAM, replace a hard disk for a solid state drive and so on. Now as it happens, I really like computers. So I've got quite a lot of these. I've got laptops, I've got desktops, I've got um, an iPad, which is another form of general purpose computer. It's on the same architecture, it's just a smaller form factor. Um, let's see what else we've got in here. Oh, I've got oh, this little beauty from uh, 1984, I believe. Uh, actually, this model's probably 1986, the Macintosh Plus. That's, uh, that's a, an early form of desktop computer. Um, We've got one of these, which is uh, from 2000. That's a, an Apple G4 Cube. I've even got computers in my car. Let's take this one and find out what's inside it. So this computer is a little bit old now, but it still contains many of the same components. In fact, pretty much all the same components of any general purpose computer system. It's just that the size is possibly a little bit different. So this main green circuit board is what we call the motherboard and this is where all of the different devices and components within the computer system will connect uh, to each other. So up here in the corner we've got um, a CD drive or a DVD drive as you can see there uh, and that connects via this quite antiquated now IDE interface but you don't need to worry too much about that but that's been replaced with SATA uh, in modern days but that connects straight down to um, a socket on the motherboard and the motherboard will have an integrated chip specifically for just managing the communication between these devices and the CPU. We've also got over here some slots where we can put some expansion cards. So they're sort of left empty and waiting for you. Um, we've got a power supply down here. So this takes in the power and provides electricity to the rest of the computer system at the correct voltages. Now, this is not an input device. People often think power is an input to the system. And I can understand why you put the electricity in, but that's not really what's happening. Inputs, they provide data to the system. So that could be things like a keyboard or a mouse. Um, whereas this is actually just providing the power to enable the whole system to run. Other crucial components on a uh, motherboard typically are some sort of interfaces, uh, some ports, so there's a collection of ports, again these are all quite old fashioned, that's a VGA port for video, uh, serial and parallel ports you will never see anymore, you will however be familiar with USB, um, and there's a built in ethernet port on here and there's sound input and output as well. And uh, on this computer, all of this is done and um, provided by the motherboard, which again, uh, was something, you know, back in the 2000s, that was becoming pretty standard. But um, in the early days of computing, if you wanted to have a sound card or sound capabilities on your computer, you had to have an additional sound card. If you wanted networking, you had to get a network card. You wanted USB ports, you had to put a USB card in. So, and they would be added to these expansion cards to take the computer uh, beyond its basic configuration. Now, of course, the most important part of the computer is probably the CPU, and that's housed under this cover. But you can just see the edge of the CPU sticking out here underneath uh, this big block, which is a heat sink to take heat away. So that's the central processing unit, and that is what executes all of the instructions that the computer has to perform in order to you know, play your video or whatever it is you're trying to do. Over here, we've got the RAM. Uh, we can remove that and show that to you. Okay, so that's your random access memory, and that is what provides, that temporarily stores all of the instructions that the CPU needs to uh, when it's running programs. So the programs actually sit on permanent storage in the hard disk, but, if, uh, but that's far too slow for the CPU to read and make use of. So they get copied onto RAM, where then the CPU can access those instructions really, really quickly and execute your programs. And speaking of the hard disk, uh, that's actually housed just under here. See if we can get it out. 
Now again, this is of a certain age, so this hard disk is of the magnetic storage type. So this actually stores data on magnetic platters that spin incredibly quickly inside here. Um, you'll probably find these in most desktop computers still today, um, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if instead of this you had a solid state drive, which is a lot smaller and a lot faster because it doesn't have any moving parts, um, but the capacity tends to be a little bit lower and they are more costly per gigabyte. Again, this is quite an old computer, so this one actually has an old three and a half inch floppy disk drive slot as well, which is another form of magnetic media. This uses um, a sort of a plasticky film with the magnetic coating, uh, which can be used to store data, but not very much of it, only 1.4 megabytes of data. So that's nearly a thousandth of a gigabyte of data stored on one of those, and they're very, very slow, but they were very ubiquitous. Um, and as you can see, computers in the, into the 2000s still have them. And finally, let's look at that DVD drive again. So this is a form of uh, what we call optical media, uh, because DVDs use light, uh, to, they've got lasers inside them, to read data off the surface of the disk, which bounces back to a sensor if there's a zero or a one, and that's how data can be encoded on, uh, on disk drives like this. So that's a basic overview of the internal components of a general purpose computer. Um, and I mentioned earlier, you know, laptops and things, well, how, how can they be the same? I mean, obviously, uh, you can't fit all those pieces into a laptop. Well, it's funny, in, in many ways you can. Um, a laptop still contains all of the same components, a CPU, RAM, uh, secondary storage in the form of a hard disk, or a solid state drive, there'll be a video card uh, built into the system. Um, but obviously it's just much, much smaller, they tend to be soldered onto the motherboard, so they're not on replaceable parts. You can't take them out, they're all fixed on. Uh, and that means that they can't be upgraded as easily, which is why laptops, you know, if you're really into pro gaming and things like that, people like to build desktop PCs because you can really fill them up with new components, the best components, you can upgrade them over time. A bit harder to do that with laptops. So laptops tend to give you slightly lower performance, but to be honest with you, a, a decent laptop nowadays is going to give you more than enough performance uh, for most of your purposes. So that's general purpose PCs. Key points. They can use any software. You can replace the software on them. They have uh, typically got upgradable or replaceable parts. You'll nearly always have a, a screen, a keyboard, mouse uh, to interface with them, networking capabilities nowadays as well. And they are pretty much what we mean by computer systems most of the time. But there is another type of computer system, the embedded system. Now, to tell you a bit more about that, I'm going to have to uh, take you somewhere else. So, as well as general purpose computers like laptops, desktops, there's also embedded systems. Now, these are, uh, the whole thing's not a computer, it's more, more an appliance where, uh, where there's a computer within it that enables it to function. And they use much smaller, much more specific purpose microcontrollers rather than a big CPU. Now, if you want to see embedded systems, a really good place to look is your kitchen. There's lots of them. Let's have a look at some of them in mine. So the first thing I'm going to show you is the oven. The oven, you think, well, that's just an oven. Yes, but this oven has a timer on it. This oven can be told to switch on and off at certain times. So here we've got some controls. These are the inputs. You can see that there's an output on the screen. I can make this uh, bring up different programs of operation, so it can sometimes go into timer mode. Other times I can tell it when to switch the oven on and off or whether to go back into a manual mode. So that's calling a program out of its memory, its stored memory, to put it into those different modes of operation. And as well as the screen being an output device here, um, the actual oven itself, the heater element in the oven, is an output device controlled by that computer. So you would set the temperature, but it's not until the time is reached the oven would actually come on or go off. So that's obviously being controlled by some kind of computer. Another example is a dishwasher. Dishwashers have the same kind of basic idea. I've got a bunch of input controls so I can set different modes. I can effectively load different programs. You might think they're very similar programs and they are, but they actually do different things. They're going to make the uh, dishwasher work at a different temperature for different periods of time. Different amounts of water is going to come in. So these, when I press these buttons, I'm loading a different program from the computer's internal memory. I've got an output on the screen and obviously I've got lights. This will also produce sound when it's finished. But more importantly, probably for a dishwasher, it also switches on and off valves and pumps to make water go into the dishwasher. All of that, the sequence that it happens, the length of time it happens for, the temperature it reaches, all controlled by a computer program 
built into the dishwasher. We've also got examples of embedded systems in cars. Now your car's probably got a much more sophisticated display than this, but it's still going to have a computer running it. So in this car, we've got things like, you know, the trip counter, uh, the mileage that's been covered. Uh, there's some information that we can go through uh, talking about how the I need to service the car, for example. All these messages are being uh, are being managed by software running on an embedded system. These are all examples of embedded systems because they contain not a general purpose, high powered CPU like an Intel Core i7 or, uh, or an AMD chip or anything like that, or even an ARM chip that you might get in your phone. These get have very, very small little microcontrollers, okay, that run short programs, um, they run on very low power, they're cheap to produce, they do one thing and they do it really well. Typically, they can't really be updated. Once they're created with that program on them, that's it, that's what they do. Uh, but they're very reliable, um, which is why they get used in all these sorts of devices. So that's embedded systems and how they're different to general purpose systems.